Uh, today is part seven our, of our series we're calling Foundations, and these are just doctrines that are basic to the Christian church, not just to this church, but that are things that are fundamental to Christianity as a whole. And uh, this is not an exhaustive list. There, I could probably come up with a few more, but just stuff that I thought was important to us. And, and today we're looking at the question of what is the church? What is the church? And uh, today uh, on the traditional church calendar is Pentecost, uh, 50 days from Passover. And it was today in Acts chapter 2 that we have the record of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon a gathering of believers, what many consider to be the birth of the church, the church at least as we know it. And uh, so we're going to take this Sunday and probably next Sunday too, and we're going to look into what is the church? How do we understand the church? Because i got to be honest, I think there's an awful lot of confusion about that. And especially when you look at the latest Pew Research Center facts and figures about the church in America. And I say the church in, in, um, in quotation marks because sometimes what people think is the church is not the church. We're going to clarify that today. And, and Pew Research has just made a lot of headlines here just in the last couple of weeks with this latest poll result. Mainline Protestants make up shrinking number of U.S. adults. Now, I'm not sure who's shrinking, U.S. adults or mainline Protestants, but somebody is shrinking here. And the conclusion of... Did we get that? It was, it was that? Okay. <laughs> Mike's like, I got it. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> The con <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the conclusion of their research showed that a greater number of people in this country are identifying themselves as no religious affiliation. Now, uh, the greatest gains in the research were those that put none for religion, and uh, and I totally get it. I mean, if if I was filling out that form, if somebody asked me, "What religion are you?" I'd say I'm not. <laughs> And people think, well, you're a pastor, so you must be a very religious person. I'm not, I don't think I'm a religious person at all, even though I'm a pastor. I hope to clarify that as we go along on this, on this message. But uh, amongst the stack of data that Pew Research put out, and the, the research is online, you can look at it, is mainline Protestant churches. And what I'm talking about is the primary denominations that make up Protestant Christian churches in America. And that could be Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and Lutherans and uh, Episcopalians and all those that fall into that category of mainline Protestant denominational churches, along with the Roman Catholic Church, which is another Christian denomination. That's how we would understand that, another Christian denomination. They've all been shrinking for years. It's fascinating. Many point to these statistics as an evidence of the failure of Christianity to win converts over to our religion or to our denomination. Now, I totally understand why people say stuff like that. I totally get it. I look at the research and I understand how they did the research because they tell you how they did their polling. And I understand how they came up with that data. But... And this is my view. You guys can do your own homework. I expect that you would and come to your own conclusions. I understand why people say stuff like that, that the Christianity in America is shrinking. But I also think that their statements belie an ignorance of what the church actually is. If we think the church is made up of churches then yes, they're failing at a catastrophic rate. Does anybody know how many churches close in America every year? Thousands. Thousand? Any other guesses? 150. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> Three to 4,000 churches close in America every single year. Of course, a phenomenal number of them open every single year, too. And I've seen them come, I've seen them go. And if so many churches fail, listen to my words carefully. If so many churches fail, then the church must be failing, right? Oh, 
Not only that, look at all the divisions between churches. I mean, even in our little town here, we got a church for everybody. You know, there's a church on every corner just about in this town. And if you go to Southern California, it's even, we were just in Northern, North Carolina here just uh, this past year. Let me tell you, you have not seen more churches than they got in North Carolina. They are ev multiple churches on every block, big and little and everything in between. There are so many churches. Why can't there just be one church? Well, I'll give you a clue. There is. There is only one church, but there's lots of churches. Now, Christian churches are separated by a common faith. What, what I mean by that, what I mean by that is everybody that gets a different idea about how church ought to be, how church ought to be, they start their own little church. And that's how we get Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and everybody else. Somebody says, well, I think, I think in order to go to heaven, you have to speak in tongues. So I'm going to start my own church because my church doesn't teach that. The church I'm going to doesn't teach that. So I'm going to, they're up, my church is obviously wrong, so I'm going to go start a church that's got it all right. That's what we're going to do. Did I tell you the, the joke about the guy that was stranded on the desert island by himself for years and years and years? And, and he finally was rescued. And as he's sailing away from the island that he'd lived on for so many years, the, one of the guys on the ship that had rescued him said, you know, I, I see you've lived here for years and years and years. I see three huts on the island. What are those three huts? And the guy that was rescued says, well, one of those is the house that I lived in. And he said, one of those is my church. And the guy says, yeah, well, what's the other one? He says, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that, that's it. That's it. Well, I think church ought to be like this, so I'm going to go start a church. And that's what people do. And you know what? That's how Calvary Chapel got started, too. And, and, if, and if there was a church in this town that did what we do exactly the way that we do it, I wouldn't have moved here and started this church. Why, why would I? Why would I do that? So it begs the question then, what is the church? Is there one and only one church? Why are churches so fragmented? And should we do something about it? Well, first of all, we have to take the time to define the church. So stick with me on this. It's on your notes in the handout. If you want a place to go, I'm going to be referring to a lot of passages of Scripture, as you can see in your notes. Um, I'm going to, a lot of the stuff uh, in this section, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. But if you want a place to turn to, and you ought to, why don't you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll meet you there in just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to get there. So what is the church? That is point number one for you note takers here today. What is the church? Now we get the word church from a Greek word. Remember the New Testament was written in Greek and the Greek word is ecclesia and it simply means an assembly. So if you uh, perhaps uh, were at, um, let's say you were in Houston last night and you went to a basketball game. I'm just saying. And let's just say that you were there with about 18,000 other screaming fans and you watched the Golden State Warriors publicly humiliate the Houston Rockets. That was an ecclesia. It was an assembly. It was a gathering of people. I'm just making this up off the top of my head. It, it, it was, that's an ecclesia. Anytime a group of people gather together, it, it's an ecclesia. We were in ecclesia this morning. They were in ecclesia last night, a, a rather depressed and embarrassed ecclesia, but there they were nevertheless. Uh, that's an ecclesia. So uh, the word uh, in the early days, the word that was used to describe the church, it never meant a building. It still doesn't, although a lot of people refer to the church as the building. 
And, it, and it's not. It's got nothing to do with the building. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the place of worship because we could just as easily gather on a hilltop out here uh, on the edge of town and, and we're still an ecclesia. We're still a gathering of people. Now, there are five basic uses in the New Testament for this word ecclesia, all with similar meanings. And there are three that are most common. So here are the three most common understandings and uses of the Greek word ecclesia in the New Testament. First of all is an assembly in the ordinary or classical sense. You can read about that in Acts 19.32, Acts 19.39, or Acts 19.41. Uh, for instance, those assembled uh, to write against Paul in Ephesus. That was an assembly, an ecclesia. Next is, and this is very, very important, and this is our 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 passage. Uh, this is 1b, and that is the whole body of professing Christians throughout the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, and that is the wrong passage. Well, I'll use it anyways, because um, <laughs> it's all in the Bible. Because there's a reference there to the church of God. Okay, It's not my church. It's not your church. It's not anybody else's church. It's his church. Let's try Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, and see if that gets any better. <laughs> yeah, well, it's another reference to the church of God. I understand why I put that in there. The Church of God, it's, it, it, there's no denominations as we understand them anywhere in the Bible. It's God's church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's not Calvary Chapel. It's not the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church. It's, it's God's church. In other words, the church, capital T, capital C, the church, that's made up of the whole body of professing Christians throughout the whole world. It's not defined by a name over the door. It's not defined by a building or a geographical location. Do you understand that? If you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then you are a member of his ecclesia. You are a member of the professing Christians throughout the entire world. This is also referred to as the invisible church. You don't see this church because it's not confined to a building. You see us here and wherever you go in the world and uh, some of us have had the good pleasure to travel in the world and meet Christians around the world. And it's awesome to be able to meet a Christian in another part of the world and say, we go to the same church, the body of Christ. That's God's church, the invisible church. But that word ecclesia is also used in the New Testament to describe all the Christians in a particular city or area. Now, whether they assemble together in one place, like we are this morning, or in several places for religious worship, there's an ecclesia. Thus, all the disciples in Antioch, forming several con congregations, were considered one ecclesia, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. So also we read of the church of God in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, or the church at Jerusalem, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, or the church of Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. This is also referred to as the local church or the visible church. We're a local church. We are the, the kind of church that we are, or what we might say is we are the flavor that we are, here in Half Moon Bay. We have a little sign out in front of the church, and when you come in, everything says Calvary Chapel on it. That's the name that we go by. We are a local church, Calvary Chapel in Half Moon Bay. Now, the common denominator is easy to spot in all of these different ecclesias, all these different assemblies, and that is the church is made up of God's people. That's what makes up the church. Now, it just so happens that the church also happens to contain many churches. You understand? I'll get to that in just a minute. This is taken, I copied this from uh, Easton's Bible Dictionary. The church visible consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion. It is called visible because its members are known and its assemblies are public. That's us. Here there is a mixture of wheat and chaff, saints and sinners. I have to assume every single Sunday that everybody that gathers in this place, not everybody believes exactly the same way or the same thing. I do not assume that everybody that walks in this door is a born-again Christian just like I am and just like some of us. I don't assume that. I can't. 
God has commanded his people to organize themselves into distinctive, visible, ecclesiastical communities with constitutions, laws, and offices, ordinances, and discipline for the great purpose of giving visibility to his kingdom. In other words, what does the body of Christ look like? What does the church, capital the church, what does that look like in the world where people are supposed to be able to walk into this place and see a little example of it in this place? Now, uh, you know, as I like to say sometimes, I think what church does is church puts the fun into dysfunction because every church is made up of, of another common denominator and this is the part where things get a little messy. And that is, it's you. It's, it's people. It, it, the minute people get involved with anything, it gets messy. Because we all bring in our different functions and dysfunctions. And in the church, like a local, visible, ecclesiastical community like us, we're just like a real family. Sometimes we get along, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we, sometimes we do really good with and for each other, and sometimes eh, maybe not so good. You know what that makes us? That makes us normal. That's what we are and that's what we do. We're just human beings. So then, the church, the church, the church that Pew Research missed, they surveyed churches. They didn't survey the church. So the church is made up of born-again believers wherever they are and wherever they gather in numbers of two or more. Jesus said, wherever two or more gather, I'll be there in the midst. The church is most often seen in the New Testament as the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. See if my cross references get any better here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. We're speaking of the authority of Christ given to him by God. He, God, put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is the head. All born-again believers of the world make up his body. Same thing in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, and then turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now let me read this passage of Scripture, verses 12 to 27, because there's something very important that I want you to get out of this. And that is that if you're a born-again believer, born again by God's Spirit, then God has a very special place for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. That's a great, great little tongue twister right there. But you get the idea that just like in a body, a human body, there are many different parts that make up a human body. So in the body of Christ, there are many different parts that make up the body of Christ. So even though there's lots of different parts, it makes one body. One body. And you, if you are a Christian, you are those parts, one of those parts that make up the body. So also with Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit, we we're all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Uh, it keeps talking about member there. We don't have membership here at the church. But he's talking about a member like a finger is a member of your body, or a heart is a member of your body, or your toe is a member of your body, or a brain is a member of your body. Those are the different members that make up the body. Now he, he says this, this is kind of funny illustration in verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? 
if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the, the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. For if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, no divisions, no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Note in that passage the lengths to which God's word goes to make clear that every single saint, every single individual Christian has a part to play in his body. Did you get that? Did you understand that? There are no superfluous parts in the body of Christ. You and I and every Christian has a very special function that relates to the greater function of the entire body. Note also that there is no mention here of churches, per se, or divisions between Christians. As a matter of fact, there isn't any mention of churches or denominations in God's word at all. So we could conclude from God's word that denominations, as we understand them, did not exist in the first century and in fact, they're nowhere to be found in Scripture. Now, let me say this. Denominations are not evil. They're just a creation of humans. That's all. One church is not necessarily the right church or the wrong church. And what we tend to do as individuals is we tend to congregate with people that believe the same things that we do. That's makes sense, but it's not necessarily the best thing to do. Because what I'd rather do is I'd rather go congregate with somebody that's really trying to get at the heart of the truth. And if they're trying to get at the heart of the truth, that means that I may confront things that I don't necessarily agree with. Then I have to decide, wait a second, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what I've thought, maybe what I believed up to this point about a given thing is wrong. Maybe I need to think about that. Look for truth seekers. Look for people that are fearless when it comes to opening up God's word and dismantling it and seeking not just God's word but seeking the heart of God through his word. You know, I think one of the mistakes that we can make especially when you're a Bible-centric church, like we are. You know, every service that we do, we're in God's Word, every single one. This morning and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night, we're all in God's Word. And one of the errors that we can make, quite honestly, is that we begin to worship the Word. And we make the Word into God. And we, and we make all of our efforts just, just getting smarter and gaining more information about the Word. But in fact, the word is the gateway to know God better, personally. It's a relationship. It's not an, it's not an issue of how smart I can be or how many Bible verses I can memorize. It's how well do I know God who is the author of it. I want to draw ever closer to him into a greater and deeper relationship with him, to know him better and better, to walk in a more intimate fellowship with him every moment of every single day. We do that through our knowledge of him that comes through the word. 
So let's beware not to worship the word. Again, denominations aren't evil. They're just an invention of man. And let's also say that those things that divide churches, are churches divided? Yes. Let's answer this question right now. Is the body of Christ divided? The answer is no. The body of Christ is never divided. Are churches divided? Yes, absolutely, and every single day. As I said, we're separated by common faith. You know, if somebody gets an idea in their head that they think that this is the way that they want to do it, and the church I'm going to doesn't do it that way, so I'm going to go out and start my own church, that's okay. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that we're not on the same team. We are on the same team. But there's a lot of things that are worth dividing over. Now, if somebody says, well, gee, you know, I'm a Christian too, but, you know, I don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. I don't believe it's the inspired word of God. So we're going to use some other books to go along with it. Well, you know what? I disagree with you. And so I'm going to stick to what I think is right. If you want to go off and do that, you can go off and do that. If you think you've got a prophet that's got a better revelation, knock yourself out. But I'm going to stick with what I got right here. You want to start a church like that? Go ahead. You want to go to a church like that? Well, it's probably not this church. So there's lots of different reasons that are worth dividing over. You want to divide over fundamentals, basics, Bible doctrine. You want to divide over things that are primary, then, then we're going to divide. You want to divide over things that are secondary? Okay, go ahead. You, you think that... Um, Speaking in tongues is evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, I don't necessarily agree with that. But if you think that that's true, that's cool. That's all right. That's a secondary thing. That's not something that I think that we really need to divide over. You want to fellowship here? You can. I'll just as equally fellowship at your church too. I just happen to think on that secondary issue, you're wrong. I think it's a secondary issue. Does, does the rapture of the church happen before the tribulation, middle of the tribulation, end of the tribulation? I think it's a secondary issue. I think it's a really important issue, but I think it's a secondary issue. I don't think it's something that's worth dividing over. There's lots of things that are worth dividing over. You don't think that Jesus was God incarnate? Going to divide with you on that one. You don't think the Bible is the word of God? Yeah, going to divide with you on that one. And there's, a, and there's a handful of others too. And, and ultimately, why would I want to fellowship with somebody that I really genuinely believe is living in contradiction to God's word. God's word makes our doctrine clear. And the fundamentals of our faith, and that's why we're doing this series on foundation, the fundamentals of our faith, they're not difficult to understand. They may be difficult to believe, but they're not difficult to understand because God word, God's word makes these things really abundantly clear. How much studying do you want to do? So then, what are denominations? Denominations commonly are Christians separated by that common faith. One wants to speak in tongues, another think that's evil, thus two churches are born. So, is the body of Christ, you understand what the body of Christ is, made up of all believers, those that have been born again by God's Spirit, anywhere in the world, is the body of Christ divided? You say, no. The body of Christ is never divided. You want to try that again? Is the body of Christ divided? Our church is divided. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. We're reasonably clear on that? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Now, understanding what the church is, the body of Christ, and understanding that wherever there are born-again followers of Jesus Christ, there is a church, then what is the church supposed to do? Here we are. What is the church supposed to do? Is the church supposed to come together every Sunday for an hour and a half and listen to me talk? Look, if, if this is it, <laughs> what a letdown. <laughs> What's the church supposed to do? Point number two, and that is the responsibilities of the church. My wife would sit here and listen to me every week for an hour and a half. I know she would, mostly. The responsibility. <laughs> I don't know. The responsibilities of the church. What, what is the church supposed to do? And this is probably one place where there's more disagreement 
and uh, misinterpretation than anything. Well, the church is supposed to feed the poor. Uh, not exactly that. Well, the church is supposed to love everybody. Oh, you know, yeah, okay, got that. Got six brief things for you to consider. Turn over to Matthew chapter 28. Six brief things for you to consider. And I'm not about to tell you that my little list here is the one and the only list or the exhaustive list or the pent-ultimate list. It's just what I put together. And you can look at that and you can say, well, I wouldn't have said that or I could think of some other things. But, you know, this is for your consideration. What is the church supposed to do? What are the responsibilities of the church? Point number two, letter A, first and foremost, to evangelize the world. Matthew chapter 28 now let's back it up to uh, verse 16 for context. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You understand that? All authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and and on earth he rules and reigns over everything go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all the things that i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the age first and foremost the responsibility of the church is to evangelize the world now, this is the primary task of every individual believer that has been prepared and equipped by the leadership of the church. Did you hear what I just said? This is the primary task of every individual, we got that part, that have been prepared and equipped by the leadership of the church. You wondered what you're doing here this morning. You may be asking yourself right now, why am I here? What am I doing here? I'm going to tell you why. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, And he himself, that's speaking of Jesus, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the responsibility of the leadership of this church is to train you and to equip you in the doctrines of God's word so that you might be able to go out and evangelize the world, to go into all nations and, and to preach the gospel. Now, Jesus did not send the church to evangelize the world. He sent every believer to evangelize the world. We sometimes look at the church and think, well, that's, that's the church's responsibility to go out and do that. And so we put something in the offering and we think, there, now they've got the money. The church has got the money to go out and do that work. <laughs> Who's the church? <laughs> it's you. You're the church. You can't put money in the box and say, now the church will go out and do it. You're the church. You're the one that goes out and does the work. Instead of putting a dollar in the offering, buy yourself a Dr. Pepper and go out and evangelize the world. It's the responsibility of the church. Every believer is to do that work. It's the work of the church leadership to equip you to do that work. Where do you go to learn God's word in the many different ways that we learn it here? This is the only place that you can get it. You have to go to church. Because when you come together, we have a purpose for coming together. And that is we're getting equipped so that we can go out and do the work. That's what we're doing. And every study that we have here is a little bit different than everything else. A little bit different ways of learning God's word. Secondly, or, or letter B under point number two, responsibility of the church, is to make disciples out of converts. That's also in Matthew chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples. Now, this is where we see the roll up your shirt sleeves kind of work getting done. 
We have to make converts for sure, and all disciples start as converts, but not all converts become disciples. You understand that? In other words, we have to make disciples, and a disciple is defined in Scripture as a learner. A learner. And I like that, because I like to learn. But a learner is more than just an event. It's a lifestyle. A disciple is a lifestyle. Being a disciple, listen to this carefully, being a disciple means leaving out or leaving behind all that is not an integral part of the process of learning. Did you get that? I'll give it to you again. Being a disciple means leaving out or leaving behind all that is not an integral part of that process. Now, I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking the same thing. Let's quit work and stay home. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Because working is an integral part of that process. Because when we go out the door of the church, that's where we go out to apply everything that we learn in the church. What you learn here, you take out the door. And that's where you go to apply it. That's part of the process. So we have to make converts. We have to lead people to Christ so that they might be born again. But then, once they are born again, it is the responsibility of the entire church to take those under our wing and say, man, you just, you just started a process. We were just talking about that process uh, last week in uh, salvation and sanctification. We're talking about it Wednesday night with Mud and Miracles, too, that once you make that decision, once you make that step, and you say yes to the Spirit of God, yes, I want to be born again by your Spirit. I want to be a Christian. Once you make that step, you begin a process. And that process is called sanctification. Gradually being set apart, transformed by the Spirit of God over the entire course of your lifetime. And part of that process is becoming a disciple. How do you become a disciple? Well, first and foremost, you come to church and you learn. We develop relationships within the church. And within the church, we have relationships with people that have been walking with Christ longer than we have. And it's from those people that we can gain a greater insight and understanding into what it means to live as a Christian every single day. We have people in this church that have been walking with Christ not for years, but for decades. Decades. And there is a wealth of wisdom in this church. Just look for a head of gray hair and talk to them. There's a wealth of wisdom in this church of people that have been walking with Christ for decades and decades. And it's from them that we can gain greater understanding into what it means. Now, there's also a, even further a process for some of us. Because I have to tell you, when I was saved um, as, uh, in, uh, at Calvary Chapel in Riverside, in March 1981, I started going to every service that they had. And then I discovered, oh, then I discovered home Bible studies. Oh, that completely transformed my life, going to home Bible study. And so I went to the home Bible study. And I was learning. And I, you know, I remember going to Bible study. Maybe this has happened to you. Maybe you've walked in. You're experiencing this this morning. I went to, I went to a home Bible study. And the guy was teaching out of the book of Exodus. And I thought, I don't understand anything this guy's talking about. But it sounded so interesting. I came back the next week. And I kept coming back, and I kept coming back, and I kept coming back. And the more I studied, the more I went to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, home fellowship, the more I did that, the more I began to understand. And the more I began to understand, I thought, I want more. I want more. And I met a guy. I met a guy at one of the home fellowships. And we were talking about this very thing. I said, man, I just, I cannot get enough of this stuff. And he says, have you ever been discipled personally? And I said, I'm not even quite sure what that is. And he said, well, it's just a process of sitting down with one other person and allowing that other person to impart to you whatever wisdom it is that they've gained over the years that they've walked with Christ, further studying God's word and, and a more personal connection with somebody. I said, I've never done that. He said, I'll do that with you if you want. I said, I'm up for that. And I did, and I spent, I don't know, probably about two years going to that guy's house every single week. Just the two of us, just walking through God's word, the two of us. And I've talked about that here before, probably not often enough. That that's a possibility here too. 
There's people in this church that would be more than happy to spend that kind of time with you. I'm one of them. All you got to do is ask if that's really what you want. And that's also how we develop or where we take our relationships that we develop on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Look, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to be a pastor that whips the flock, but I will. I, I, <laughs> just, just this once. Is the kind of relationships within the church that develop into deeper, more disciple-making relationships, that happens on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and on Thursday. And if you don't come, you're not developing those relationships. If you're just coming on, on Sunday morning expecting to develop those relationships, it's not going to happen. You need more than that. I need more than that. If you come to this church on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you'll notice that I'm here. I'm not here because I have to lead these things, though I do. I'm here because I want to be here. Because what takes place in those studies, in those times, is what I'm craving. Developing relationships with you. And hopefully you developing relationships with me. Because when we get to know each other, we're going to find out that you've got something for me that I need. And I've got something for you that you need. And until we really begin figuring that out, we're just going to be a general ecclesia. We need to take that next step to become the church, an active member of the body. Remember what Paul said back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, what, what, what if the eye says to the, to the nose, I don't need you? You can't do that. In other words, for a body to be healthy and whole, it needs all of its parts, and it needs all of its parts functioning. How are you doing? <laughs> to be a functioning part of the body, you got to come and you got to participate. Because you add something to this mix in our little ecclesia here. You add something to this mix. And if you're not here, what you add isn't here. If I'm not here, what I add isn't here. That means we've got a stew, but just not quite so many ingredients. And if you like stuff like that, you like a lot of ingredients. You know, when Deb makes a salad, it's like a kitchen sink salad. It's like any, anything in the refrigerator goes into her salad. And, and that's kind of us. You know, we're a little bit of everything. Some of us are leafy and green, you know. So <laughs> I guess what I, what I keep trying to say is I need you to be here, and you need me to be here. And look around at the people that are seated all around you. You need them to be here too. And they need you to be here. To be a functioning body. And the healthier each one of us is, when we come together, we make up a healthy church. The small C. And we're doing our part to make the church healthy. Because we're participating. Part of that is making disciples out of converts. Boy, the Apostle Paul got it, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 14, when he's talking about, you know, this one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, I'm pressing towards what's ahead. I got work to do, and I want to be in this game. I don't want to just be an observer in the game. I want to be a player in the game. I want to be, I want to be the one that's leading other people to Christ. I want to be the one that's helping other people grow in their relationship with Christ. I want to be the one that's developing deeper and closer relationships with everybody in my little ecclesia so we get to know each other better so you can add into my spiritual life the things that are missing that only you can add. That's why I have such a horrible time when anybody leaves this church. I have fits. I get stomach aches. I don't sleep. I hate it when people leave the church because when they do, well, there was, there's some that when they leave, it's probably okay. But, but, but when people leave the church, it, it, it physically hurts because what they add into my life is now gone. And I don't like that. I'm a loyalist. 
I'm a, I'm a one woman man. I like I like deep and long lasting lifelong relationships. That's what I like. And that's what I want. And that's what I want this church to do and to be. But sometimes I get content with my spiritual life and don't wish to go any further for fear of what it may cost me. You understand that? I stop in my growth. I stop in my developing of relationships with other people. I stop in that, in that whole process because I'm afraid of what the next step is going to cost me. You know, I loved once and I'll never love again. What a shame. What a shame. Well, I, you know, I had a deep friend one time and they hurt me, so I'm never going to have a friend again. What a shame. If that is my fear, if I'm afraid of being hurt, if I'm afraid of going forward, i gotta, I got to think twice about that. Because that's not the body of Christ. And that brings me to the next point. Under point number two, letter C, and that is to provide fellowship and support for believers. Turn to Acts chapter 2. We'll finish it up here. We'll pick up the rest next week. I got to tell you, typically when I stand up here, there's just a little insight into what I do up here. Typically a Sunday morning service, I have roughly about two and a half to three pages of notes up here to work through. Today's message has six pages of notes, so just telling you. And that is the next part, and that goes right along with what I was just talking about, about relationships in the body of Christ, and that is to provide fellowship and support for believers. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 46. And they, this is the very first church, the church that was born on the day of Pentecost. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, they had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. What a great thing that is. And all you have to do is sell all your possessions and give them to me. Oh, no, wait a second. That's not the way that it works. Isn't that the funny thing about some of those cats on TV? If you want to get blessed, you have to send your money to me. Something's not, something not right about that. It's interesting to note that in all descriptions of the church in the New Testament, the church is never described as a place for non-believers to gather. It's always described as a gathering place for believers. Now, that, of course, doesn't mean that you can't bring believers to church or unbelievers to church. The church is never described as a place to bring unbelievers to get them saved. Although, of course, that is what we do. So many, I mean, this, uh, so many other things that we do, these are things that we've made up, churches have made up as we've gone along. Our liturgy, our style of service that we do here, we make this up as we go along. It's not in the Bible that says we got to do it like this. There are plenty of things about the church that are. Leadership, order, things like that. The church is always is, is described as, as a place for making disciples and all that that entails. That's why I've described the church, church, the big church, the body of Christ, and I hope this church as a hospital for sinners and not a museum for saints. In other words, you don't clean up your act to come here. You come here in your process. And this is a part of your process. Coming to church here is a part of your, your process. Anybody that's been in recovery, you understand the process idea. And it's the same in scripture. God's got a starting point. You've been born again. God's got an ending point. That's when you die. And the process is everything in between. And, and church, the, the local assembly, the local ecclesia, 
Calvary Chapel, Half Moon Bay, this is where we come for fellowship amongst one another and support in our walk and our relationship with Christ. And there's so many different levels. I like to think of it as uh, concentric circles of fellowship in the church. There's some that come to church. We know you on Sunday morning. We don't know you the rest of the week. You don't come any other time or we don't see you that often. We love you. God bless you. We are so happy that you're here. And there's some of us that are here uh, for almost everything. Some of us are here for every single thing. And the people that are here for every single thing, those are the people we get to know the best, right? We, we develop closer and deeper relationships with them over time. You, you just have to decide how deep you want to go. And, and I can tell you, because I know myself and I know the leadership of this church, we're ready to go as deep as you want to go. You want to come in with all of your pain and all of your dysfunction and all of your shame and all of your sin. Bring it. Bring it. You don't scare us. Of course, just about the time I say I've seen everything, I've seen something I've never seen before, so I won't say that. <laughs> but I'm telling you now, bring it all. Because this is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. Now, what you're going to get when you come in here is you're going to hear stuff like this sermon and all the other sermons that we preach. I preach on Sunday mornings, the Bible studies that we do midweek. And you're going to hear a lot of things that you may agree or disagree with, things that are going to challenge you, things that are going to challenge your unbelief, things that are going to challenge your belief. Things that you're going to look at and say, wow, okay, I never thought about that. Or, gee, this is harder than I thought. Uh-huh, that's right. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? This is the hardest and yet the most fulfilling life that any human being could ever live, being a Christian. And we come in here and we work on it together so that when we go back outside the door, we are equipped and we're ready to go for whatever may happen, for our relationships with our friends and with our family and with our jobs and with our school, with our parents, with our kids, with our spouses. We're being equipped for virtually every single facet of life. How do you be a Christian in this world. That's what we do here. We do it all the time. The church is also a place for accountability. That means sometimes you're going to come in and going to say, man, I blew it this week. Sometimes you're not going to be here and somebody's going to call you up and say, hey man, haven't seen you around. What's going on? Sometimes we're going to catch you out there in the public eye, maybe doing something you ought not to be doing. We're going to say, hey, come on, man, what's up? What are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that, and you know it. Come on, man, let's go to church. <laughs> let's go to Bible study. Accountability. And sometimes that accountability will even include discipline. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17, gives us our model for discipline within the church. You know, you want to come in to this church anyway, you want to make trouble, that's not going to work. You know, you don't get to come in here and start teaching false things to people and try to get them to leave this church and go elsewhere. You don't get to do that. We need each other in the process. And God has given us the church. God has given us church leadership for that purpose. It's important to understand that church leadership, no church leadership, tells you what to do. No church leadership says, well, you know... We don't think that you should do this. We think that you should get in line. We've prayed about it, and we think that you should do this. Now, that's not what church leadership does. Now, if you want an opinion, I'd be glad to give you one. You want to say, well, gee, you know, I'm praying about taking this job. Do you think I should take it? You get the same answer from me I'll give you every time. I'll tell you, heck, I don't know. <laughs> Have you prayed about it? <laughs> you know, what do you think? Do you want to take the job? you think you ought to take the job? What do you think about the job? You think it's a good job? You think it's a good idea? Take the job. I can't tell you what to do. But I can tell you a lot of other stuff. You got a question about God's word? I can at least direct you to where you can find an answer. I may not have the answer. Don't have all the answers. In spite of what I tell my wife, I don't have all the answers. But you come in here and you work your process to be a Christian. 
to live as a Christian, to grow as a Christian. And that's what the church is for. We've got more stuff. We'll pick it up again next week because there's just so much more. Because one of the things that I want to get to as we finish up on the responsibilities of the church is I want to get to Christ's work within his own body. What is the role of Christ, his relationship to the church? I want to get to that. We'll deal with that next week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're, we're grateful that your word has given us as many answers as we could possibly uh, ever want to know. And that when it comes to being the church, the real church, not the church that gets researched and polled, but the church that exists as born-again believers throughout the entire world, your body, we're thankful, Lord, that you've made that clear. And that we don't have to worry about what church we're a member of. We're a member of your body, and that's all that counts. Lord, we thank you that, that you've given us the grace and, and that you're patient enough with us that you put up with all of our churches and all of our disagreements that has created those churches. And Lord, I just pray that no matter how many different churches there are, that we would all be laboring on the same team for the same goals, evangelizing the world, making disciples out of those converts, building up, supporting believers and making disciples. Lord, I pray that we'd all be laboring for those same goals. And Lord, I pray that this church, this little ecclesia, that we would be laboring for those purposes that you've set down for us, that we would be faithful to those things, that we'd be faithful to you, that we would be faithful to each other. Lord, we need you and we need each other, and we're thankful that you've given us to one another for these purposes. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.